Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're honored to have Dr. Pham join us today and give us his time and uh, share with us his experience, ex expertise, managing patients with cardiogenic shock. So let me just give you a brief uh, bio about uh, Dr. Pham. He is currently the chair of cardiothoracic surgery at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Dr. Pham received his medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and completed his residency in general surgery and cardiac surgery at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And he became the director of adult heart transplant and ECMO programs at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center for six years and the director of thoracic transplant research laboratory at the same institution. In 98, uh, he was recruited to Miami and became the director of heart, lung transplant and artificial heart programs at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. In 2013, he was recruited to the University of Maryland School of Medicine to be the professor of surgery and the director of heart and lung transplantation, circulatory assist device and ECMO programs at the University of Maryland Medical Center. He joined Mayo Clinic uh, Jacksonville, Florida in July of 2017 as the chair of the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery. Uh, well published, more than 200 scientific peer reviewed papers the editor of a textbook, the Iorda, received many grants from the NIH and other societies, awarded many uh, distinguished awards, amongst which the Award of Ex for Excellence in Medical Research by the Vietnamese American Medical Research Foundation in 2005, and the Healthcare Heroes Award by the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce in 2007, and the one I was just talking with him about, uh, the mayor and the board of county commissioners of the Miami-Dade County had declared April 19, 2013 as Dr. Pham's day. Dr. Pham, it's a pleasure having you and uh, I'll turn it over to you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for allowing me to share some of our experience uh, uh, with you. And uh, as mentioned earlier, we enjoy the, uh, the uh, collaboration uh, between uh, the two institutions. Uh, we, uh, we learn a lot from you uh, uh, in, 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 in seeing what kind of thing that you uh, you able to do there. And uh, I think it's a, it's a two-way street in terms of our learning. Uh, together. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the uh, temporary mechanical support for cardiogenic shocks. Um, <clears throat> and in uh, the uh, disclosure, I don't have any rel relevant financial relationship or off label investigation use. Um, for the um, the, the outline of the uh, talk, uh, I will uh, describe various types of temporary mechanical supports. Uh, then I discuss the indication and contraindication of these uh, uh, devices, uh, uh, and then their potential complication. And, and then at the end, I'll show you some of the outcome data uh, on use of uh, uh, mechanical support for cardiogenic shocks. Uh, here is a, a, a diagram uh, from uh, Dr. Rob uh, in terms of management of cardiogenic shock. Uh, he used the a spoken hop model uh, to show uh, uh, how a patient that go through the the uh, healthcare system and where uh, they can be treated uh, for cardiogenic shock. Um, you know, the uh, the initial would be the uh, spoke hospital where uh, the patient become uh, uh, resuscitate medically and, and then some other procedure uh, such as uh, revascularization, reperfusion or garbage. Uh, uh, and then uh, if that um, uh, not uh, uh, enough, then uh, temporary mechanical support uh, can, be, uh, can be used, uh, including these uh, devices that listed there. And then, you know, if, if the thing uh, is not able to uh, recover the patient, then the, the, the hope uh, hospital where uh, long-term vets, transplant span or destination vet would be uh, we become uh, uh, a resource for for the spoke hospital. The um, temporary mechanical support uh, can be uh, 
classify as the uh, uh, percutaneously uh, implanted devices uh, as uh, shown uh, here uh, in this slide, uh, the interaortic balloon pump, uh, the impeller uh, from uh, 2.5 to the CP and RP, and then the tandem heart uh, uh, VA act more. Uh, those are the things that percutaneously can be implanted in, in the surgically implanted device, including the uh, Impeller 5.5 and the uh, central map. For the uh, temporary percutaneous mechanical support uh, for cardiogenic shock, um, uh, in this slide, it shows for right ventricular support right now. Uh, on the market, uh, we have three uh, modalities that can be used. Firstly, the impeller CB. And then the tandem heart uh, 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 protect duo from the right atrium to PA, and then the VA at more. Uh, now, the impeller RP, um, I don't know if your center is still using that, but uh, uh, we haven't used that much anymore. Uh, the protect duo uh, device uh, with the with the cannula that can go from the internal jugular vein into the uh, right ventricle and to the pulmonary uh, artery. Uh, is our preferred method uh, because it's uh, it's allow us to mobilize the patient uh, better and and and, and uh, the the technical aspect of inserting it is not that uh, uh, as difficult as the impeller CP. Uh, so and then the VA act more obviously uh, uh, that uh, will be discussed a bit uh, more. The uh, the left and right support. Uh, including VA ECMO, uh, intraortic balloon, and the impeller, uh, uh, and it uh, uh, from 2.5 to uh, nowadays we have the 5.5, which is uh, replacing the uh, 5.0 because the device uh, is a, is a better and and it uh, have a, a, a longer uh, duration of support. Uh, the tandem heart, uh, uh, I don't think that many centers using it now. It's been replaced by the impeller, more or less. Uh, um, the uh, clinical indication for temporary mechanical support uh, is uh, shown on this, uh, in this, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the communication uh, of uh, acute MI is uh, quite common in the cath lab of many hospitals. Um, and then you have uh, uh, severe congested heart failure uh, due to ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, 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 cardiac allograft failure, um, uh, failing to uh, wean from cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, nowadays, also another um, another modality that uh, that uh, can be used to support those patients uh, until they recover or until uh, transfer to another destination. Uh, uh, center. Uh, myocarditis, um, uh, we see uh, a few of these patients because uh, our uh, GI cardiology, Dr. Cooper, is an expert on, on, on myocarditis, uh, so we see a fair uh, number of these patients, uh, and, and usually they uh, recover well after the initial shock uh, if they receive support uh, uh, on a timely fashion. Uh, and then some other, uh, uh, including the cath lab use uh, for uh, high risk intervention that you all familiar with. Uh, the the workhorse for a long time has been the interaortic balloon pump, uh, and and as shown in the uh, indication here, uh, it used to be uh, more for high risk PCI quarry uh, perfusion uh, before revascularization. Uh, cardiogenic shock, especially if you need to unload the left ventricle in case like the mitral regurgitation uh, or as a bridge to other device. Uh, the uh, contact indication uh, uh, is listed below there uh, where um, you have aortic regurgitation or some body who have uh, aortic aneurysm either in the abdomen or in the chest. Uh, uh, would be a contraindication, and the other is a uh, severe uh, peripheral vascular disease and, and sepsis, where you have low uh, peripheral vascular resistance, the balloon may not help. Uh, the 
the role of in aortic balloon pump uh, in cardiogenic shock um, has been investigated by a, a randomized trial uh, in 2012, and the the data show that the in aortic balloon pump counterposition uh, did not significantly uh, reduce the 30-day mortality uh, in patients with uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, uh, so um, most center has uh, done away with uh, with the intraortic balloon pump for cardiogenic shock uh, uh, since the advance of the impeller uh, device. Uh, in in the following uh, the remainder of the session, I would like to focus on these two uh, temporary device, the impeller device and the uh, the ECMO. Uh, the uh, the uh, as I mentioned before, the imp impeller uh, can be used to support the right ventricle or the left ventricle, as uh, as shown in in, in these slides here. Uh, and for the uh, left ventricle, are you all familiar uh, that uh, the device can be inserted either from the groin or from the axilla and uh, go into the uh, ventricle and it uh, sucks the blood out from the ventricle and put it in the ascending aorta here. Uh, for the right ventricle support, the groin uh, has to be inserted in the in the uh, in the femoral uh, area where it uh, is directed into the pulmonary artery. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's the reverse of the left support where the blood is sucked from sucking from the uh, from the right ventricle and then exactly into the pulmonary uh, uh, artery. The uh, pros and cons of the uh, impellers are uh, shown in this slide. Uh, it can be quickly implanted and nowadays it's uh, readily available in the cath lab. Uh, the uh, cons is that um, sometimes if you have severe shock, the impeller 2.5 or CP won't be able to support the patient. And, and it will help for the first uh, couple of days, but after that, especially the, uh, the, the, the CP, it will uh, not be adequate and also it cause some hemolysis if you uh, support it for a long duration. Uh, also the issue with the positional, it's usually, um, inserted in the groin area and the patient, uh, 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 it, it can be positional that it, the, 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 uh, the, um, the device can migrate uh, either out or into the ventricle. And, the, uh, and I mentioned the uh, durability is not that long and the immobilization of the patient is uh, another issue. Now here is some of the contraindication for the uh, uh, impeller. Um, uh, if the patient have a LV clot, uh, that is a, an absolute contraindication. You don't want to to get that clot into the uh, the aorta and, and and cause a stroke. Uh, if the patient have a, a mechanical valve, uh, certainly that is a, a, contra, a contraindication because you couldn't get the catheter through, uh, through the uh, aortic valve. And we have a patient with severe aortic stenosis and, 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 and we try to push that this patient have calcified aorta, uh, uh, aortic valve here and, and try to push that uh, catheter through the, through the valve. Uh, and you can see that uh, it, it tried to get through that valve, but it couldn't, so it caused a bend in a, a king in this uh, impeller, and uh, and that uh, that uh, make it uh, quite difficult to get it through there. Uh, and then uh, the other is the you know it's a peripheral vascular disease, uh, but but with the peripheral vascular disease, uh, most of the time in the femoral area we. We uh, we have alternate access in the uh, in the axillary uh, artery that we so we can overcome that kind of problem, and uh, we'll talk more about uh, the axillary uh, approach. Another another common uh, complication that we see uh, when we got the patient in is the ischemic. Uh, ischemia of the, the limbs, uh, the side where the, uh, the impeller inserted, including the CP. And as you know, uh, these cardiogenic shock patients, usually uh, they require a lot of um, uh, inotopes and vasopressor 
the vessel it can be um, uh, vasoconstrictive uh, uh, at time uh, of of high uh, of high uh, inotropes and high vasopressor. So uh, they can get ischemia, but this is a, a good example how you can take care of the uh, ischemia temporarily. Uh, you put in a, a sheet that uh, going down to the leg here for integrate flow, and then on the other side, uh, you can get another uh, sheet for in the artery and then connect the two together and allow it to perfuse the the uh, the leg on the uh, on the side where they had the impeller. So that that uh, that's a good uh, approach uh, to uh, to uh, to take care of the immediate problem because um, you know the leg. Uh, after about uh, six or eight hours of ischemia, uh, ischemia, it can cause problem with the with the uh, compartmental syndrome, and then not uh, recovering that uh, legs. Uh, we have done uh, fasciotomy on uh, some of these patients, and some require amputation, which uh, quite a, quite a tragic event. So, so that's one of the potential uh, complications you have to watch out for. Now, we next um, is, um, is the uh, area of the ECMO. Um, the ECMO is, uh, you know, it looks complicated when you see a patient at bedside, but it, it's quite simple um, uh, uh, on principle. Uh, uh, what you do is you get the blood out from uh, the, the right side of the heart, uh, put it through a pump, and that pump uh, will uh, pump the blood into an oxygenator. And, and in this oxygenator, the gas uh, exchange happens, the CO2 is removed uh, through the sweep of this uh, gas, and then the O2 is getting absorbed. So the, the blood, when it goes through the membrane oxygenator, it allows the, uh, the CO2 to be removed and the blood to be uh, oxygenated, and then it returns to the left side. Uh, of the heart here, and that will uh, help with the uh, we support the heart and allow the heart to rest and and and, and uh, recover when when it's possible. Uh, and there uh, and then several several con um, configuration for ECMO, and you know during the pandemics here we see more and more of this veno venous ECMO. I'm, I'm sure you. Uh, uh, most hospitals in, in Florida at least uh, have the capacity to do that. Uh, and and the, the veno venous ECMO, it mainly is to support the lung. So what you do is you get the blood out, the venous, the, the oxygenated blood out from the venous system, in this case, the inferior vena cava. You put through a pump and oxygenator and then uh, in his exchange or to keep it warm and then return into the same venous system. So uh, in this case, in the superior vena cava, and then most of those oxygenated blood preferentially go into the into the right uh, ventricle into the lung, and then uh, then then uh, perfuse the uh, rest of the body. Uh, and, and these uh, patients require a good uh, heart. So um, so this uh, this is a a, a, a good uh, way of supporting the lung until the lung recover and. In the data show that the with the veno venous ECMO, uh, we have uh, uh, approached uh, seventy percent survival uh, uh, on on most, and then the center of excellence, the survival is 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 uh, higher uh, even. Uh, so that is um, uh, for for lung support veno venous ECMO. And then the uh, veno arterial ECMO, um, as I mentioned before, we get the blood out from the venous side here and oxygenate the blood, and then send it back to the to the arterial system. It can be from the femoral approach here, or it can be from the axillary approach. Uh, The uh, indication for uh, ECMO, uh, VV ECMO, is uh, shown on the slides. Uh, patients that um, have hypoxemia with a low uh, saturation on 100% FiO2, uh, they have CO2 retention or it's on higher airway pressure, 
one of the things we see quite often with the COVID patient is that they tend to have pneumothorax very often uh, when they, uh, they they require ventilation, uh, a mechanical ventilation, because their lung uh, is quite uh, compliant, uh, compliant, and then also they develop these uh, uh, micro bullies uh, in the lung. And if you put on the uh, the pressure ventilation, uh, typically, you know, because they, they are severely hypoxic, you have to increase the airway pressure and then they develop pneumothorax and, 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 and that uh, certainly is not helpful at all. And, and we have seen patients coming in with pneumothorax com commonly. So nowadays we are uh, more aggressive and get them onto VV Act more early on before all the uh, high uh, pressure. Uh, I mean, w even with an airway pressure of about 30 uh, or a bit higher, they develop these pneumothorax. So that's a, one of the, uh, the uh, problem with the COVID patient. Now, um, the VA ECMO, uh, as uh, shown by Dr. Gokhlin and others, is that it, it's a bridge. It's a bridge to uh, either uh, recovery, uh, dura uh, durable mechanic support, or heart lung transplant. It's, uh, it's a temporary support. And, and the indication that uh, I mentioned earlier in earlier slide, but the same thing here. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is that the uh, pulmonary embolism acute, uh, with acute uh, RV failure, uh, this is a, is a very good uh, approach and, and data from our center and other has shown that it's a very uh, effective approach because if they have a, a saddle uh, embolus, uh, their right ventricle fail, and, 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 and not only that, any kind of manipulation you do, uh, especially when you try to sedate the patient, they, they deteriorate very quickly. Um, in the past, what we do for those cases, either send them to the uh, CT scan, uh, to the intervention radiology or to the OR for, uh, for removal of the clot or, or doing something about or put a, a, a catheter in to give TPA centrally. But as long as, as soon as they get sedated and they, they are rest. Uh, because the, and, and when, if they are rest, it's, it's a difficult problem. They, they, most of the high won't survive because they have a, a combination of, of lack of ox oxygenation, but also lack of circulation. So these people are very difficult to revise uh, when they arrest. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, we have developed a way to do this ECMO, uh, peripheral ECMO uh, 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 under, uh, under local anesthetics. And even if we bring them to the OR for, uh, for a procedure or for uh, acute pulmonary uh, embolectomy, we also try to put them on, on ECMO before we induce anesthesia on these patients. Uh, uh, doing it by uh, by local anesthetics, so so that's one of the things. And if they arrest, even in the operating room, they won't survive. Uh, okay. Uh, the um, the this is just uh, uh, show you the uh, the uh, indication. Go ahead. We've... Go ahead, Dr. Pham. Sorry, yeah. Brent Bedeau. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Going back on that slide, go back. When you, okay, so you told us about VB ECMO and VA ECMO. Uh -huh. And I thought ECMO increased afterload, and you have it up there that if you are in, uh, well, you don't have shock, but it, it, there are cases where you use VA ECMO and an impella if you have biventricular dysfunction. Yeah, 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 that, that's great. That's a very good question. And I will show you some of the data on that too. And, uh, and we'll show you some uh, interesting uh, innovation that we have here and I'll show you uh, uh, in, in a little bit, but that's a wonderful question. Okay. Okay, and here just a review of the indication for, for ECMO and, and we can talk a little bit about uh, uh, eCPR or cardiac arrest and, and ECMO uh, uh, in a little bit too. 
uh, the, uh, the the pros and cons uh, here is the pros. It is quick. It can be done at best time. Uh, uh, it can be uh, the patient can be activated, especially with the VA uh, ECMO for cardiogenic shock. Uh, most patients, the lung is still good and they still in good shape. Uh, they can be activated and ambulating with with the VA ECMO. Uh, uh, and and that certainly allow them to recover. And some patient, I have patient on 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 ECMO for uh, or for uh, for more than uh, 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 three weeks and, and able to recover uh, their cardiac function. Uh, you know, patient come in with the acute MI cardiogenic shock. You know, after you put them on ECMO or or any kind of uh, mechanical support, temporize them and send them to the cath lab where you can do revascularization and that that is you know the national shock trial has shown that that is a, a, a better approach with better survival than just uh, try to go to the cath lab and try to revascular, uh, revascularize them and i'll show you some of that and show that it, it really reduced the 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 uh, the severity score after you put them on ECMO and reduce the lactic level and, and let the liver and everything recover the the cons of this is that uh, the as you mentioned the left ventricle is not decompressed so it's it's um, it ha have a high afterload and if you, your heart function is not not great they can develop uh, pulmonary edema and everything and then we 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 need to deal with that uh, there's several approaches to do that. Uh, here is a typical ECMO patient we put an arterial cannula. Uh, usually is 17 to 21 French, and and with the cardiogenic shock, usually that don't need the whole the whole cardiac support, so you can get a, away with a, a smaller cannula like the 17 French, and then we always routinely put in a, a, a integrate perfusion catheter here. It's easy to do it. Uh, before you have the cannula in. So what we do, we will percutaneously cannula the distal common femoral artery, uh, and then we we'll cannula the the iliac uh, through the femoral here. And we try to do, and this side is the venous uh, catheter here in all per percutaneous nowadays. Uh, you would try to avoid uh, putting everything in one side because you know you have a compromised idea of blood flow and if you have this cannula in the venous side that increase the venous pressure so the perfusion pressure will be low in that side and and it's prone for ischemia or edema and things so we try to do one side arterial, one side venous and that's how we uh, typically doing it at most centers doing that way now. Uh, so that is one issue, ischemia of the leg, which we uh, routinely use that uh, integrate perfusion catheter and avoid that problem. And then there are another thing that I will talk to uh, the upper uh, body uh, hypoxemia, which is the notch south syndrome. I will show to you a little bit. Uh, um, okay, we have uh, uh, several years ago, and as I mentioned, uh, by by put the patient on 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 ECMO uh, or, or temporary device to support them when they in shock, uh, you reduce the risk score and 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 uh, and, and and improve their survival. Uh, and and we are show that in in some of these patients here, we have a small series of patient, uh, and when they arrive, their SDS score, which is the risk for mortality to, to predict mortality, is high. But if this is before ECMO here, and then after ECMO, uh, the risk score lower. And and chemically, you can see here uh, before ECMO and post ECMO here, you can see the CVP is 23 and come down uh, nicely. Uh, serum creatinine come down, pH coming in. These are these are good, but some patients have a pH of 7.1 or, or, or lower uh, when we see them in the lactate level and everything to uh, higher uh, before ECMO and after. So essentially you put them on a week of ECMO, you converted uh, an emergency uh, high risk cases into a low risk uh, patient that can be done electively. Especially we found it on, on the, the LV um, infarct uh, septal, uh, the um, ventricular septal defect after the infarction, and those notoriously have very high risk uh, if you take them to the OR right away. But we, with the ECMO, we're able to temporize them and we converted them to uh, from a, a high risk to a low risk uh, patient. 
So we have a series of 11 patients here. You can see the uh, it's a popular of, of cases and one of uh, of these thing is the BSD patient. And 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 they have a uh, high STS score and high mortality, but you can see here in hospital mortality is zero plus zero and 30 day mortality is zero. There are, there are uh, a couple of patients that die later on uh, 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 76 days and 214 days because of the uh, 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 left heart failure. And they are because they are uh, different contraindication for uh, mechanical, for, for long term bed or for dance band. So they have no other option and they die, but uh, you can see the survival is quite nicely with that uh, group of patients. And this is just show you another survival data in a different form. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of exoteric here, but we also uh, do a, a kidney transplant on a patient support on, on ECMO after they, uh, the primary cardiac uh, 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 transplant fail. And, and this is a 60 year old uh, man who have uh, normal ischemic cardiomyopathy and, and chronic kidney disease. Uh, he came in with cardiogenic shock. Uh, initially uh, in the cath lab, we put in an, 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 an impeller uh, CP uh, urgently in the middle of the night. And then uh, 24 hours later, we converted him to uh, an LVAT uh, with a centimac pump for the temporary right ventricular support. Uh, and uh, the uh, the the kidney uh, initially he was he had chronic kidney disease he didn't require dialysis but after all this shock and the trauma and the uh, the 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 uh, surgery and everything he required dialysis and he he was maintained on that uh, and then he received a, a combined kidney and 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 and, and heart transplant. But unfortunately, uh, when we put the heart in, the heart doesn't work uh, right away. The kidney is still in the cold uh, storage uh, bucket. So we decided to put him on ECMO, temporize him, and then bring him back to the, uh, the, uh, the, the next day and, and put a kidney in. And after 24 hours, uh, I mean, after five days on ECMO support, we able to wean him off ECMO and, and he's able to go home with a functional kidney and, and, and heart. Uh, this is, you know, we don't see that very often. We did two cases like that, and it worked. But that another application for uh, for ECMO. Now the uh, the the Harlequin syndrome or the North South syndrome I mentioned to you before. If a patient have both lung and heart failure, and if you do an ECMO uh, in the femoral approach. What you do is you take the uh, deoxygenated blood out, oxygenate, and put it back in the in the femoral area, because with the ECMO you cannot completely empty the heart. So you you have the heart is still ejecting some, and that blood come from the heart are uh, deoxygenated blood because the lung doesn't work. Even you intubate them and you uh, have a high uh, peep and everything is still not enough. So and, and in this scheme here, you can see the blood going and meet somewhere between, uh, 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 I mean, uh, in the thoracic aorta or some, sometimes it go, go a bit higher. But the deoxygenated blood come from the heart, they come from the lung and through the heart, it perfuses the quarry artery and it perfuses the, the, uh, the brain. So that's not good, not, not only uh, the patient who have some uh, anoxia, but the heart doesn't wouldn't recover because of the com continuing uh, hypoxemia on the heart. Uh, so, so uh, for for uh, peripheral VA ECMO that support cardiac function, if the lung doesn't work well, uh, we have to have a better approach than that. Uh, and and one of the 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 um, the approach would be to do what we call a VA uh, VV and VA ECMO. So you get the blood, uh, the oxygenated blood out from the venous side, from the right side, oxygenated, and then send it back not only into the uh, into the arterial system but also to the venous system. So some of the blood going to the 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 the, the venous system here will. Uh, be oxygenated and going to the lung and going back to the heart. It's not like a hundred percent like in the arterial system, but it's enough to to allow the patient. I mean, you have a saturation of uh, 89, 90 percent that will be enough to support 
the vital organ, the, the brain and the, the heart. So that's another scenario. And we just recently have a patient like that not too long ago. Now back to the uh, the question earlier, one of the uh, the, 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 the problem with the, uh, the VA ECMO is that uh, the left ventricle is not decompressed. As you can see in here, this, this you have uh, uh, a lot of uh, stagnant flow here, smoking in the left ventricle. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, you need to have some blood flow to the lung to, to, um, to, uh, to prevent micro uh, thrombites in the lung also. Uh, if, if this happens, uh, uh, if the heart is very, uh, it doesn't have uh, adequate function, uh, it doesn't empty the blood out because you put the, the ECMO flow into the arterial system, you increase the afterload uh, in that system, the right vein, the left ventricle, uh, it's a weakened uh, left ventricle. It may not be able to overcome that pressure. So, in that situation, um, as you uh, alluded to earlier, we use a combination of uh, impeller. We put an impeller in here, uh, and then try to decompress this, uh, and then also the ECMO to support uh, the patient uh, at the same time. And that work. Sometimes what we do is <clears throat> we have our cath lab people to create a, a balloon septostomy in the atrium. So you have an atrial septostomy before the, we have the impeller or center doesn't have the impeller readily available, we do an atrial septostomy. So it created a communication of, of the, the left atrium to the right atrium and that where you can drain the blood into the venous system, decompress this side here and allow uh, us to support the patient that way and, and the heart will have uh, a chance to eject in something uh, or decompress the left ventricle. So, so that's another approach. Here is the patient example of the patient with the impeller 5.5 and VA ECMO. <clears throat> it came in with cardiogenic shock and renal failure <clears throat> and <clears throat> And uh, the lung wasn't uh, working well either. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, the, the right and left ankle didn't work uh, and, and quite severe with uh, the left ankle didn't work very well. So we decided to do um, the uh, combined impeller and VA ECMO at the same time. <clears throat> Most of the time, as you know, the if you have cardiogenic shock <clears throat> from an acute MI or other thing, even though the right ankle uh, doesn't work initially, but if you support it for a period of time, the right vendor will recover, the left may not be recovering. So uh, our intention was to, to, to at least initially provide uh, biventricular support with the VA ECMO, and then uh, later on win the ECMO and leave him on a 5.5 to support the left ventricle. <clears throat> so the way we do this here, it is a unit here, we just um, <clears throat> figured out how to do it to allow the patient uh, ambulate. So what we did here is that we have a venous drainage from the internal jugular vein here, and we have a, a, an axillary access here. We put a bifurcated graft into the axillary, and one, one, one limb of that graft will allow an ECMO cannula go in, and the other limb of that graft allow the uh, impeller to be inserted into the left ventricle. So th there's a Y connector here allow one access that allow, <coughs> uh, one arterial access that allow two devices to be inserted. <coughs> and with this configuration, uh, this patient able to walk around, get exercise, and he wait for about uh, three weeks uh, like this and finally get a heart transplant and he went out. He went home about five, uh, uh, 10 days after the heart transplant. And I saw him back that recently. He's doing very well. So that is one of the the uh, the thing that we get. Oh, you can see. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's see, I can walk there. Yeah. Uh, and and um, uh, you know, um, one of our partners, former institution, has uh, sub, uh, written up this thing here. If you this slide shows the survival. Uh, of, uh, of ECMO, VA ECMO alone for cardiogenic shock here versus the uh, impeller and VA ECMO combination. Uh, and th there's a survival advantage of the VA uh, ECMO and impeller uh, compared to the, the conventional uh, v, uh, uh, VA ECMO alone. Um, <clears throat> 
some of the uh, predictor for uh, uh, survival uh, after cardiogenic shock has been uh, published by uh, by a group in Germany here. In this study, they show that uh, out of 3,846 patients uh, who have cardiogenic shock, uh, uh, VA ECMO provide a survival uh, at a hospital discharge about 42%. And, and some of the risk factor that uh, predict the survival as shown here, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this associated with, uh, with mortality as shown here, uh, especially the pre of uh, pre ECMO cardiac arrest, uh, congenital heart disease, uh, and, and, uh, and chronic uh, renal failure, uh, some of these things that uh, predicting uh, whether the patient survive or not uh, after VA ECMO for cardiogenic shock. Uh, and here is the thing, uh, uh, the, the data on the uh, ECMO and pulmonary uh, embolism uh, acute, uh, with acute right ventricular failure. The data uh, varies depending on when it was published. Uh, as you can see here, early data show a survival from 50% to latest survival uh, when I was at Maryland. That's what we did here, and the, the survival here is quite uh, quite good uh, with with these patients with shadow embolize and right ventricular dysfunction. Uh, and, uh, and here are the data on the survival ECMO with fulminant myocarditis. Uh, and again, uh, the survival can quite high, you know, from 70 to 100% with that. So, so uh, that's a very encouraging data and, and, uh, and, uh, and it'll be uh, improving. Um, some of the uh, uh, predicting uh, factor, a prognostic factor for, uh, uh, for VA ECMO on uh, myocarditis as shown here. Uh, the, uh, this group reviewed 88 patients with acute fulminant myocarditis and survival of 55%. But the, the prognostic factor including the, uh, the uh, CP, high CPK, uh, VT or VF, uh, 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 doing the uh, asystole, and they saw a beneficial effect of uh, IVIG treatment on that uh, study. Now, uh, just a remainder, a couple of minutes, I want to touch base on the ECMO and C uh, ECPR, which you will see here more and more. Uh, the, 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 the data is still limited, but what we have so far is that <clears throat> if the um, the the uh, CPR perform uh, more than uh, 21 minutes or so. Uh, the acceptable uh, outcome uh, uh, is quite low. Uh, after uh, 15 minutes on CPR, only 2% that uh, survive with uh, acceptable neurological outcome. So. You know, in Europe, they are very aggressive and they have a, a mobile ECMO team that go out uh, uh, in the, at the site of cardiac arrest and try to put them on ECMO and everything. And they have a reasonable survival, but, but you know, in, in the US, we don't have that system yet, except in some uh, center where, uh, where cardiac arrest in the emergency room and we can, uh, uh, mobilize the team uh, very quickly. Uh, we be able to do it, but uh, the after after uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, CBR the survival uh, in terms of neurological function is is quite low. The the heart will recover, but the the, the brain will have some problem. And and we have you know there's always exception uh, 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 for the rule, but. You know, here I, I, I saw one of our patients in Maryland, a 25 years old pharm pharmacy student who, uh, who uh, have a, a malignant uh, v, uh, fib VTAC arrest uh, from, from uh, our uh, use of uh, high energy uh, drinks uh, during the final exam. And he received a CPR of 107 minutes. And in that sense that we have the ECMO team and everything ready, so we cannulated him and, uh, and he's uh, survived and able to, uh, to go home with uh, neurological intact and he's able to finish his uh, uh, pharmacy's uh, PhD uh, and, and so far it did well. 
uh, so the lesson is, uh, you know, never give up. But uh, so I think the hours uh, is uh, up. But at least currently we have the available um, uh, temporary support system here, and you have quite a bit of choices here, as you can see. Uh, VA ECMO from for from for right ventricular support, VA ECMO impeller protect do until uh, by ventricular support as shown here uh, there. So I'd like to stop here and, and uh, take some questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pham. That was great. I have a question uh, about the possibility of having the VA ECMO. Has it been uh, done where you're, uh, you take the V out and bring back a catheter into the IVC across the intraatrial septum to the left atrium with the A arm? in unique cases where you have terrible RV failure, but the LV is okay, or you lost the lungs and it's vasculature. Has this been done or there's any way of benefit from that approach? So uh, to put the cannula in the uh, septum, uh, transeptal uh, cannulation of the uh, left atrium, is Correct. that right? Correct. Yes. I mean, that is the old uh, tandem uh, approach, uh, tandem, tandem device to, uh, to, to, to have it done. Uh, we are working and trying to have to improve that because the, 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 uh, the technique is only require more expertise. And, and the other thing is trying to um, stabilize that cannula. It can be a bit uh, challenging sometimes because uh, little movement can dislodge the cannula either outside or inside further. So, so that uh, because of that reason, it hasn't become very popular. I mean, hasn't become popular in the early days, in the in the early 2000s. That that uh, has been the uh, the approach. Uh, uh, commonly, uh, you know, the Texas Heart Institute at advocate that, uh, and they have some experience. But I think nowadays people do, uh, do away with that approach. Okay, I'm only 20 years late thinking about it. <laughs> well, no. That's that's a good thing though. But we use the transeptal, I mean transeptal uh, uh, approach to decompress the left ventricle. And we do it. Uh, we still do it, and the same center is still advocate using it because it certainly it get the uh, the, the the patient uh, uh, less another procedure and less expensive too. I mean, think about it. The impeller is still costing you uh, uh, in the in the range of twenty five thousand uh, a device or long uh, or more. So. So, All right. Thank you, Dr. Pham. Yes, I have two questions. One is, I did look up April nineteenth to see what other good things happened on that day, and by far, your naming of the streets the best thing that happened on <laughs> April nineteenth. There's, there's some bad things that happened. That so, my I, I know this talk was more geared at. Um, extracorporeal devices with shock and things, but I would uh -huh. like to hear at some time um, how you go about, uh, with the cardiologist, evaluating the right ventricle and suitability for LVAD. Um, you know, they've taught us through a series of lectures to use the right heart cath and pressures, and I've had patients that go for LVADs, and some have come back on milrinone. I know the Centromag can be used for 30 days. I just can you make a comment, or is that a whole nother lecture to talk about your thoughts on right ventricular function? Well, you know, uh, you 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 are you right on. You know, the they say the right ventricle, the new frontier in in cardiology and cardiac surgery, because people in our field have been struggle quite a bit with the you know you can support the left ventricle, but but. The long term, you know, the data from the long term LVAD and other things, the right ventricle is the one that really uh, the, uh, the, the caused the problem with the patient. And we have uh, we have a patient even early on, the right ventricle seemed to be okay, but after a period of uh, a year or two, the right ventricle started uh, on the VAT, on the left ventricle assist device, the 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 uh, the uh, the, uh, the LV uh, the RV fail. So so there are many. I mean, there are people talking about different ways, the uh, the pappies and all other things to try to uh, try to uh, to to assess the right ventricle. But 
I mean, the, the, the short answer, if we don't have a good way of predicting it, we, we, we use all the things that we can, uh, can, can do to, uh, to, to predict it, but, but it, it's not um, easy. Uh, right. right. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, from the technical point of view, we try to, let's say if we put a vat in, we try to do through a thoracotomy, avoid, open the pericardium because the pericardium, uh, as you know, it stabilize the right ventricle and, and you don't do, you don't want to do a stenotomy to, to not only open the pericardium, but also uh, cause some trauma to the right ventricle, which is quite marginal to begin with. Uh, started from the technical perspective, but uh, the common sense is to, uh, we have a developed different approach to how to do that. During the surgery, we also try to ventilate the lung, minimize the, the ischemia to the lung, because as you know, when you put a patient in cardiopulmonary bypass, you take the blood away from the lung, and during that time, uh, if the patient doesn't have a good bronchial circulation, the lung can be uh, have a subclinical damage and increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, and then it causes right heart failure, acute right heart failure. So there's a, a different way to, to try to, to improve the cardiac function, and we use nitric oxide liberally to improve that right. uh, also. So, Very good. So. Very good. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, well, if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Pham again for joining us and for this wonderful lecture. And uh, we really appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you, thank yeah. you. Yeah, bye-bye.